Hello everybody, I'm Raphael Perry and it's time once again to delve into Steve Jackson's sorcery. Now, when last I left off I was here in this sort of central courtyard-like area with a big statue, trying to decide where I wanted to go, what I wanted to do. The hour was growing late and my hero does need to rest. Now, the southern side over by the main gate seems like a death trap. I'm not going to go that way anytime soon. Should not draw attention to myself. Likewise, I don't want to go to the stocks. That pretty much leaves this rather large building here with what appears to be some kind of winged creature on the top, like a statue of a winged creature. All this warren of alleyways here, which seems to be considerably smaller than this area. Now, that's not a lot of housing for the non-combatants of this place. If I were to hazard a guess, I would suspect that this area here would be more likely to provide a safe place to sleep than this building here. But also, that entering this, this building during the hours of darkness would be less conspicuous than doing so during the daylight. This looks like it could be a, a guard post. These look like pews or benches. In which case, what are these ones doing facing this way? And this gateway gives me the feeling that this area here is significantly more high security than the abandoned one over on the west. And there's a great big light shining out of that tower that makes me think I'm really supposed to go there. Don't ask why. Then again, I do get a feeling that a lot of these side areas are optional and will include older encounters from the original book. Also, for Zed spell, it might be worth just forging straight up the middle and seeing how far I get. Chances are I probably wouldn't even get this far, but you never know, I might get like around here. And I wonder if I can enter these buildings. So, overall, I think I will go towards the arched building. Although I have voiced my concerns that it might be some kind of administrative centre. You stroll through the arch into a well-appointed empty courtyard. The stars are visible through a dome overhead. From a small booth by the entryway, a guard not the entranceway, a guard nods to you. Brother. I should not speak to him and continue through because it's what is expected. So this is the small window and the guard post, right? This looks like some kind of storeroom. You step out into the courtyard that fills this enclosure. The place is blessedly quiet, with several routes leading out of it. A dome looks up at the starry sky and you spot the occasional birdman flying overhead. A fountain plays in the centre of the courtyard. I'll look at the fountain. This, this could be a good place to sleep. The fact that he recognised me as a monk may mean he expects monks to come here. This is this was a place where I would not be out of place and it could be a worth... Look at the fountain. The water from the fountain plays merrily over several stone statues set into the centre of the bowl. Arcing satires, weeping maidens, aged men, head-butting orcs. It must tell some legend, but what that legend might be has clearly been lost to time and the wearing water. A few guards wander past the arch, checking inside, though what they are looking for is unclear. It might not necessarily be me. I'll drink from the fountain and hope it's not some kind of negative magical effect. You cup a handful of the sparkling water and raise it to your lips. A moment later you spit it out, gasping for breath. The water is quite foul. Um, I could sleep here. I think if I... Huh. 
A door leads out of a main square to the, of the inner city, but there are several other doors leading off from the courtyard. One is signposted Nylock, but is closed up for the night. Nylock being the quartermaster of the guards. Yeah, this looks like a... Um, side chamber, dark hallway. Um, look, this bed... This looks like it could be an office. This has no bed. A chest full of what could be shields or bolts of cloth. Now these definitely look like bolts of cloth. Um, and we have this pile of broken wood on the floor. Stairs leading down to a lower level here. Which may be some kind of dungeon with spiral staircase going even lower still. Two of them in fact. And a tunnel leading out, possibly beyond the walls. This may be a really bad place to sleep. Given the heavy guard presence. Let's take a look in here and hope we don't get into trouble. Oh, hello. That's a carved part of the bed because the pillow's in front of it. You choose a small side door which opens to reveal dirty living quarters. A bare rug covers the floor and an unmade bed lists in the corner. A wooden chest sits at its foot facing an empty table. This is presumably home to some lowly guard or other. I'll examine the bed. Not going to pull up the rug. It may be filthy. I could get infected. You go over to the bed and rifle through the ratty covers to discover nothing but a stained mattress. Hay pokes out of one side. It doesn't look like anyone has slept in it for a while. Even so, the owner could come back and I could get in trouble. Dig in the hay. There could be something... If the hay's poking out, right, that could be because someone stuffed something in there. You dig around in the hay and discover the last rat to attempt the same thing, but nothing more. I'll look under the bed. You peer underneath the bed with your weapon drawn, but all you find is an old shirt. Okay, I'll... If I sleep out in the corridor, guards may wake me in the morning. They might ignore me and just think, oh, he's just a monk. Um, or they might be like, hang on, what are you doing sleeping out here? This is, this is common public space. You're in trouble. I sleep in this room and pray. Um, this bed does feel rather unhealthy. You turn away from the bed. Let's check this chest. You squat down in front of the chest. There is no lock. I'll examine the chest. You scrutinize the chest, running a finger along the latch. It appears safe. Well then... You flip open the lid, and I will step back. You step back quickly, but nothing else happens. The box appears quite empty. Nothing jumps out of it. There isn't even a cobweb or a loose coin. Maybe this is a simple servant's room, in which case, again, I'd be in trouble if I just understand it. Uh, tip the box over. Hang on, stand up from stepping back. I've already standing, surely. You lift the box out from under the table and turn it over. Then you hear a click from somewhere behind you. Okay. Well, this is a death trap. <laughs> you turn and rush towards the exit, but you are too late. A heavy portcullis has dropped from the ceiling, barring the doorway. You are trapped. The state of the bed should have been enough of a clue. From somewhere nearby, you hear a hissing noise. Sounds like gas. You hold your breath to listen. The hissing is growing louder. I'll look around. You look around the room, the floor of the room, expecting to see a snake. Nothing moves. You cough sharply. The breath from your mouth is a, has a greenish tinge. There is a cloud descending from the ceiling. Poison gas. This is not anyone's living quarters. This room is nothing but a trap and you have walked straight into it. Can I cast a spell? Can I cast... Oh, that map went horribly out of focus there. Zip. Yeah. 
Let's hope I don't appear in front of someone and give myself away. You move the starlight in order around you, and the ring of green metal on your finger begins to glow and glitter. You are suddenly torn through the very air to the courtyard, where hopefully no one witnesses me appear out of thin air. You appear rather gratefully in the corridor. No one seems to have noticed your escape. I will sleep here. This feels so risky. You find a quiet corner of the courtyard and curl up like a rat. The sound of the fountain is deeply relaxing and you feel yourself quite ready to sleep before you have even settled your pack. Let's hope this doesn't end badly. Your snoozing is interrupted by a sudden boot, studded boot to your gut. You open your eyes to see a group of guards standing over you, weapons drawn. I literally called it. Who are you? One demands. Well, I'm a monk, obviously. Um, I'm but a humble traveller. Travelling where? The guard demands. Away from here. Oh, there's no getting away from Mampang. The outer world doesn't exist. It's just a mirage. Everyone knows that. A second guard pipes up. You think he might be the Annalander? We were told to look out for any strangers. The first one shakes his head. I doubt it. The Annalander is supposed to be a cunning opponent and mighty warrior. I doubt he'd be so stupid as to get caught by us. And on that logic, the guards move away and let you go. Great! Ish. You better move on, but which way now? Um, probably out of here. The hour is still late. In fact, it's just getting lighter. Um, something tells me this is a bad idea. Is this Nylock's office, the one that's closed at the moment? Um, I think I should get out of here before it gets any worse. We get back at you. You return to the east side of the bustling square. The arch to the merchant's building leads away there, way here. An alleyway runs past it. An empty pillory with stocks sits to the north of here. The cold night lingers on. You could cross the square or explore the fringes. I think I should try and find some shelter. Oh, red eyes. Right. Currently, I require a number of things. I need more clues. I need more keys. I need more rations. And I probably need more items because I haven't been finding very many of those so far within the confines of Mampang. In order to get more rations, I may need more gold. You enter an alley littered with refuse. Buildings either side are leaning or collapsed. Uh. In the dim half-light, you nearly trip over two men who are leaning against a wall. They straighten and turn to you. Seems we have a visitor, one says. His eyes are closed, and so are his comrades. These are the deadly red eyes of Kar, whose very gaze can burn. Brother, one greets you nodding. So, be arrogant, get out of my way, is likely to escalate the situation and provoke them. But it's also the way someone in this location would be likely to behave and what they might expect. If I ask them, what are you doing so far from Kar? They will know that that I've been in other places, right? They'll know that I've I expect them to be in Car where they are not, and so they will either know that I'm not a red eye. But this is this is tricky. Neither of these options are good. Hmm. 
it'd be, it would be best to just silently walk on and not provoke them. What are you doing so far from Car? We are wandering, brother, the man replies. A moment later you hear the, front, the crunch of footsteps. There is another now standing behind you. I will bless him, like the monk I am pretending to be. You raise your hand in a wordless blessing. The sightless creature nods its head in reply. F be with you too, the creature replies and stands aside. You continue along the road. A lane leads off. A little light glows in the east. I look down the lane. Looking down the lane, you see a large tavern, but it appears to be closed at the moment. You had better sleep when you can next find somewhere safe. You lost a little maximum stamina, ran out of provisions, died, and found one new clue. The Archmage is looking for you. Oh, wait, when did that happen? I think that's because I let the guards see me fly. Was he looking for me when I slept in the cornfield? I don't remember. In the wheat field. You follow the road to a junction where a collection of nestled winding alleys lead away. It must be morning by now. You have been awake all night and are weaker for it. Peering down them hints at a maze of twisting paths and shadowy nooks. There is a small fire here with a few, which a few figures sit glumly around. I'll look at them in case they're red eyes. The people gathered here have a cluster of tents to one side, along with packs and gear. A small fire burns in a dugout pit, and they sit around it, chatting over a bubbling stew. Red eyes don't need a fire. They can literally send fire from their eyes. I'll size up the scavengers. You look over the group around the fire. They are poor and half-starved, but there are at least 30 of them. You cannot hope to overpower them all. If they were, if you were to attack, you would almost likely be surrounded and stabbed in the back. A rat scurries over your foot, then stands nearby, boldly staring. Clearly, I have. What's this? It's not entrenched. It's not ensconced. There's a. I've trespassed upon its domain. That's how confident the rat is. Cast a spell. Risky. Many potential witnesses. I'll walk up to the fire. You approach the fire and are invited to sit down. Might even be able to exchange a few things. The people around the fire are all friendly enough and in good humour, dressed in shabby clothes. You address the chattiest of the lot. Greetings. Greetings yourself, she replies, laughing, jerking her thumb at you for the benefit of the others around her. Do you live here? You ask. <laughs> if you can call it that, she shrugs. We're working, really. We're treasure hunters. I don't see much treasure. You say. Ha! <laughs> Good one. It is in the alleys here, hidden in the loops. It's a hard living because you never know where to look. These alleys are enchanted, then? Cursed, more like. The paths wander, or maybe it's for buildings. All I know is that you find a garden one day, then walk the same route the next and stumble into the temple instead. The eyeless gods himself couldn't navigate that place. But people live in there, you insist. How do you survive? It's only a few. Even then... Luck, I'm guessing, or instinct, like a pigeon has. The ones that are born in the alleys seem to be able to find their ways in and out again. Do you know your way around the city? You ask. We're all the best gutter rats the city has to offer, she replies. We can get from anywhere to anywhere in this place. Huh. 
How do I get into the central tower? You don't. Tell me Manpang's secrets. Why do you want to know about the secrets? Do you know where the vaults are? They're like, oh hell, what do you want to do with the vaults? Are you trying to get us all killed or what? Um, tell me some of Manpang's secrets then. Tell me some, tell me some fun stuff, you know. You say with a charming grin. The biggest secret of all, she murmurs. They say it's in the old abandoned college, but we don't dare go there. Some do, another remarks. None come back, though. Whatever the alleys have got, the inner college is at in as it ten times worse over. The hunter pokes you in the arm. What about you? Who by Greta are you? I'm uh, just a travelling monk. I'm not going to tell him I'm the Annalander. Although it'd be interesting if they were like, we're the plucky defenders. We, you know, we 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 will absolutely help you overthrow the Archmage. Oh, the Annalander, we've been waiting for him for years now. He has come. He has finally come. I don't think that's going to be the reaction I'm going to get. In fact, they are surprisingly friendly at the moment. But we're in a good mood. I don't think they're planning to rob me just yet. She laughs. <laughs> <laughs> Manpang doesn't get travellers unless something's changed round here. All right, the alley's dangerous. Notice I can't ask about the vault anymore. Meaning either I missed my chance or I wouldn't have got a very good answer anyway. Oh, yes. First off, you'll probably get lost and starved to death. Otherwise, there's no telling what will, what will appear. What? Kelmondir there once run out straight into a dragon. Next day, of course, he didn't. Uh, how big are the alleys? Anything else? Just wait and see what she's willing to tell. A few old treasure hunters get stuck and lost. Probably caught by whatever shifts around the alleys themselves. They're quite mad, so keep your sword handy. Do people come out of the alleys? I probably can't afford to hire a guide. I don't think my single coin's going to cut it somehow. You asked, looking at them curiously. Sometimes I met this girl last week who just stumbled out. A fortune teller. She read my palm. Oh, what did she... What was her name? She called herself Briar Patch. She replies, or just Briar for sure. I mean, Briar is quite... Yeah, it's kind of nice. Although, with the, the R in the end is missing, so that's why... Hmm. The treasure hunter picks her teeth. Look, good luck to you if you do that, if you go that way, but I wouldn't. Now, off you get. You get to your feet. Charge at the scavengers. Why would I possibly do this? Why? <laughs> Perhaps if I hadn't noticed how many of them there were. Um, cast a spell. To make them all dance, make them all love me, make them all worship me. No, no, I'll look at the alleys. The alleys are a rat's nest of buildings and winding streets. They seem to go on forever and yet curve immediately away out of sight. I'll look at the buildings. The buildings surrounding you are old and poorly built in stark contrast to the martial efficiency of the rest of Mampang. Most are sagging and leaning, but you can see shadows moving in the windows. Despite the grim setting, people still live here. I'll explore the alleys or follow the road. Several alleys lead off from here. I suspect this section with the alleys is a good place to find treasure and possible clues but also an extremely dangerous one. The inner college area has been abandoned for as long as anyone can remember. I could have cast how or sus, couldn't I? Um, I will not enter the alleys at this time. You pass by the alleys and follow the road as it heads towards the rising wall of Mampang. After a while, the path opens out into a stony clearing. The air sits a little, still cold, but fresh. Guards walk this way and that across the square. 
the space. And the Archmage is now apparently looking for me, so I need to be much more careful. I'll look at the flagstones. You know, head down, contemplative, look like a monk. The flagstones of this square are smoothed and worn as though by torrential rain or centuries of people passing over them. Speaking of people. The people in this square are moving this way and that, seemingly without purpose. They all seem quite concerned and busy, however. I'll look across the square and around it. Across the square is a low wall set with a door. The guards do not seem to be guarding it, but none are going anywhere near it either. You could elbow your way through the strange crowds filling the square. Try not to get robbed. You cross into the middle of the small square. Guards move this way and that across the flagstones. A few clouds scud across the sky. In one corner of the square is a tent from which, from which rich smells are rising. A food cellar has a low tent with a cooking stove. A few of the square's wandering populace pause by it to eat before continuing on their endless circuits. This is not a good place to hang around. Also an expensive one. All right, I think I'll head back this way. You return to the edge of the square. Guards walk this way and that across the space. You could elbow your way through the strange crowds filling the square or head back out here. I think I may need to enter in afterwards, after all. You enter the crossroads near the tangled alleyways. I will not attack the scavengers. And as for casting a spell, they might realise I'm using magic. This will be dangerous. You head into the alleys cautiously, trusting to luck as you choose your directions. As the sun climbs towards its peak, the winds blowing between the buildings pick up a little. The paths turn this way and that until you reach a fork. Look left, look right, look left again. You look down one of the alleys. It seems no different from the other you followed here. Indeed, it looks exactly the same. From, not van. I am not American. The second alley looks all but identical to the first almost as if they actually are. Perhaps I should have cast a spell before going in after all. Your instincts suggest the left road, but you will have to keep moving. You must surely be reaching the edge of the alleyways by now. You have walked a considerable distance. To your surprise, the alleyway emerges suddenly into the crossroads by the fire pit where you started. That's okay. I had a safe journey. The fire at the crossroads is still burning, and the scavengers do not marvel at the fact that I emerged alive. I will cast a spell, and I will see if Sus or How are available. Look at that. You weave the enchantment, and a calm voice begins to speak to you. Head east, and be wary of dark corners, the voice says, for there are many dangers here. Do they mean east in the alleyways, or just east in general? You could return to the alleys, or make your way across Mampang. This is definitely east. Into the courtyard... Beware of dark corners. If I approach the gate, will that attract it? You return to the middle of the small square. Guards patrol the area. The blazing sun cannot seem to warm this place. As you walk, you become aware of three spindly figures staring in your direction. They look like red eyes. Sightmasters! Sightmasters here with weapons? That's actually really bad news. Their large eyes are a sure giveaway. They are sightmasters from Annaland. What are they doing so far from home? One beckons you over. Right. Thoughts. This on the floor 
looks dodgy, right? The first thought, if they're this far from home and nobody leaves this place, they are traitors to Annaland, who are sympathizers of the Archmage. And they recognize people by my garb and know what to expect. Secondly, I was told that when I was able to obtain the crown, I should take it to the top of the highest mountain peak or, or highest place I possibly could, and that Sightmasters would be watching. This could be they. They're beckoning. If I don't go, they might become insistent and cause a scene. So I will approach. They're not standing in a dark corner, are they? The blazing sun cannot seem to warm this place. All right, no, I think this is not a dark corner. You approach, noticing that the three look like those who guard Annaland's borders. Their leader leans into you and whispers, Annalanda, she nods, the whole fortress is looking for you, and here you are waltzing around dressed like a monk. What are you doing here? A few of us have made the journey, the Sightmaster responds, to prepare the ground for you, Annalanda. Her companion produces a heavy, scratched-looking coat held together by thick ties. Put this on, she hisses. It is a cloak of disguise. It looks like they might tie me up with it. Like a bit like a straight jacket. I'll look at the coat. You've never seen such a cloak before. It seems remarkably bulky for a cloak of disguise. It's made from gold crest feathers, one of the Sightmasters said. It will make you invisible. The Sightmaster of the cloak pushes it at you. It at you. Wear it. Hang on. A cloak that would make me constantly invisible would make the rest of this adventure far too easy and is unlikely to be presented so simply. This is a trap. How did you get here? You hiss. How did you get here? How do you think, she replies. The eagles are here. They're waiting for you to do your job and not get caught. My instinct is telling me this coat is a trap. You refuse the coat flatly. The sightmasters shake their heads. You fool, the leader says. You will be captured for sure. Annaland is depending on you. The entire old world. Oh. I mean, I have a spell of invisibility. This very much feels like a Zed spell situation, and I'm not sure I'm ready to cast the Zed spell again just yet. Also... So the Zed spell is like our limited rewind in this adventure. Hmm. But if I'm trapped, can I if I'm if I'm tied up in this magic cloak, can I even cast the Zed spell? Very good question. Um They recognized me as the Analander. And they haven't pointed me out and made a huge scene, right? They haven't kicked up a fuss. So they're not trying to get me caught and arrested. They could be hoping for some big reward. Um, and they could feel that they can't overpower me without the coat. Maybe I should accept it. Am I talking myself into a bad situation here? Right. If it is a coat of invisibility, I'm not going to be able to wear it the whole time. There'll be, like, specific scenes and encounters where I can use it. This feels... How would that work against the stone ram? Does it see me with its sightless eyes? Or No, no, it doesn't. So... Oh... The sheer amount of writing required to make every encounter from here on out 
um, work, you know, to, to have an invisible version and a non-invisible version is a massive effort. And it feels like that it could be done. If, wait, 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 let's, wait, 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 wait. The whole fortress is looking for you, and here you are waltzing around dressed as a monk. A few of us have made the journey to prepare the ground for you. It's a cloak of disguise, and it will make me invisible. Hang on. To prepare the ground for you implies they know why I am here. But the Archmage and his minions could have briefed them. The Eagles are here. I'm inclined to believe that, but them here inside the fortress feels a bit odd. Um... I do have the Zed spell. Saying I won't wear it without running away. Then they might start a scuffle and get the attention of the guards. Um, running away will make people notice me because it'll be loud and noisy. And I'll be moving quickly and in a crowd. So the flat out refusal... If it is a disguise, wouldn't if it... Hmm, I'll, I do have the Zed spell. You accept the coat. You place your pack down as the Sightmaster drapes it around you. She tightens the ties. The fit is rather uncomfortable. I'll loosen it myself, I may be unable to. Uh, looser, pray. pray. Pray loosen this garb. Oh, don't worry, the Sightmaster replies. You will get used to it. As she speaks, the tote coat gets tighter. Open this coat now. I knew it was a trap. Open this coat now, you hiss. What are you doing? Now, now, says the Sightmaster with a grin. This wouldn't be much of a holding coat if we just took it off you again. The coat's grip tightens again. You can now barely breathe. Your coat is tightening further. You do not have much time. Um... Can I cast Zip, teleport out of the coat? Draw my sword. My arms are restricted. Grab at the coat. Run for the alleys. Um, my pack's on the ground. I can't afford to leave it. You cannot cast anything. The coat has pinned your arms to your sides. You hear the bone of your chest crack under the pressure. You must escape. That's not going to help. Charge the Sightmasters with the coat on me. That's not going to help at all. Grab at the coat. You can barely move your arms. An effectual grasp at your waist. In, and if, to, so if ineffectually grasp at your waist instead. You struggle and twist against the ironclad grip. But, as you, but it has you constricted. You cannot get any air into your lungs. Your vision dims. The coat gets tighter and tighter. Your lungs have been crushed by the coat's magic. Once again, death grasps you in its icy hands, only to lift you up impossibly high. Should have, should have followed my gut. The spell finishes in a blinding net of starlight that winds around your body like a sheet and takes me back again to here. Once more, the explosion dies back. Ah, the second time is no more pleasant than the first. The plane builds and then you explode outward, teeth and skull and limbs flying in all directions. Once more, the explosion dies back as though receding. You look around yourself once more. I'll move away quickly. You turn your cloak up and move away quickly. The last thing you need to do is draw attention to yourself. The road runs past you east to west. You must keep going. I'll go this way. You follow the main road around a corner. You pass broken buildings fallen into disrepair. 
Some still show signs of habitation. It passes by a large gate. The sun has reached its highest point now. Before you is a stone façade that stretches the length of the street. Two men in heavy robes sit on the steps. I'll greet them. You greet the two men, and one of them grins. Greetings, brother, one declares. Feel free to enter, but you will have to excuse us. My companion and I are a little busy betting on a pattern of the crowds. I'll go inside. You nod and make your way through the gate. The one place where this disguise is most likely to help me, or most likely to give me away if I don't behave like a monk. You step into the yard of the monastery, where I might be able to sleep. It is much quieter here, and a sense of calm peace exudes from the building as though protected from the evils of the citadel around. Well, that's suspicious straight away. A short flight of steps leads further inside to a wide, busy hall. Nearby, a monk watches you with gentle interest. I'll speak to the monk. Greetings, the monk says. You must be a novitiate. I've been here for many years. He'd know. He'd know. Well, that is correct. Welcome to the fold, then. How are you settling in? It is too soon to say. Either of those answers could be incorrect. The monk laughs. I feel that way too, and I've been here for many years. She smiles. Oh, she? Okay. Do you need assistance, novitiate? Where can I get a meal? We all eat together in the hall. It will not be for some time. You nod and move away, disguise intact. Asking if monks can go anywhere in the city might rouse her suspicion. Cries and cheers come from inside the monastery building. Let's go and see what they're all up to. And let's hope I don't behave inappropriately and give myself away. You climb the steps into the monastery building. This place seems rather busy for a monastery. Monks and citizens crowd around long tables and a commotion is coming from a crowd to one side. Wide doors lead deeper into the monastery itself. Small, iron-lined windows dot the walls, allowing a little light. Most of Effie's monks, are, there's no I after the F, so most of Effie's monks are gambling or betting in one way or another. One stands on one leg, while another counts seconds. Opposite, two monks stand under a tree, guessing when a particular leaf will fall. Along a far wall, surrounded by many spectators, is an intricate race for rats. There are plenty of distractions here to disguise the fact that I am casting a spell. I would like to cast the Suspicious spell. Looking at the stars, you craft the magic, and a calm voice begins to speak to you. But for once, the voice is reassuring. This place holds no unwelcome surprises. Its message intoned, the magic gives out. Most people here are gambling. Several monks supervise the betting of various sorts, but most are participating. I will pray for healing. And it is much appreciated. The rattle of dice and the grumble of betting comes from a side chamber. I bet the minimum stake is more than one gold. I also bet they're playing Swindle Stones. And I'm not very good at Swindle Stones, so uh, <laughs> the main hall. And there's a door on the other side. Um, let me see. Is this going to be another Swindle Stones episode? You walk over into a long room set with a wooden table on which several games of swindle stones are being played. You find a monk who grins at you. Fancy a game, brother? he asks. We stake ten gold pieces in Effa's honour. I, I don't have that much. Um. Here then, he hands you ten gold pieces from his pocket. In Effa's honour. Now a game. Well look, he's literally given me the money to stake, so sure. That is a mean-looking bastard. That doesn't look like the kind of generous man who'd just give me ten gold. 
Is he hoping that I'll lose and try to win it back with the money I don't have that he thinks I might have? I'm not sure. The monk counts out three dice each and takes first bid. Ooh. By F. I have never seen you before, brother. You are new here? Two ones. Yes, three ones. Um, you are most welcome. Everyone comes to us sooner or later. Four ones. I think I've got to call it. He could have two ones. Wait. Here's the problem, right? If he has... He initially, initially bet two ones, implying he probably has two ones. I also have two. We've gone to three ones. But if he doesn't have two ones, he's gone to four ones, so I now have to go higher. Yeah, these are all really bad. Five ones? No way. Uh, you seem most confident. Gonna call it, and he will win this round, I think. Yep, there are four ones. The monk wins this round. Yeah. It's unlucky when that happens. I'm going to start with a single one. Hmm. I'll raise that to two ones. Try two twos. Calling it. Hmm. Calling it. Well, uh, yeah. Only one two. If a monk wins a round, yeah, I'm losing this one. Bye, F. Let me see. Two ones. Two twos. By F. Call. No twos. The monk wins the game. Okay. The monk nods, nods sagely while recommending his soul to F. A fine match, the monk declares. Another? If I ask him to lend me more money... Am I going to get into debt? I'll decline. The monk nods. True luck does not always favour play. He agrees. I mean, there's more than just luck to it, but yeah, sure. You get up from a long table, the monk bidding you goodbye. You return to the courtyard. I mean, I definitely want to come back here at mealtime. You slip back into the main courtyard. You could go further into the monastery or take your leave. Can I bet a single gold here? You walk up to the rat course, elbowing your way through the crowd. Four rats are hurrying through an assortment of turns and obstacles, trying to reach a moulding morsel of cheese fixed to a spike at the far end. A monk with scars on his face directs the proceedings. The scarred monk, look, monk looks up at you. Here to bet... I have some questions. Ask away, if a monk says. Why do you gamble so much? He'll be like, by effer, you should know you're wearing the robes of our order. Do the rats enjoy racing? I don't know. They run without prodding. It could be they like the cheese. Are the rats magical? I highly doubt it. What? No, why would we use magic rats? They just run, after all. <laughs> the monk shivers. What a horrible idea. Anyway, a magical rat? There might be one over near the alleys, but in the whole magical alleyway area. I'll place a bet on a rat. I wish to place a bet, you declare. Oh, this should be an interesting race. The monk handing the wages assures you the stake will be 30 gold pieces. What do you say? Yeah, this is too much. I'll pass this round. You decline to bet and the race goes on. The rat you had your eye on loses by inches. Next round, starting soon, the scarred monk shouts. You in for this one, the monk asks you. It's 30 gold pieces. What do you say? Yeah, I don't have that much. You admit the scarred monk shrugs and the race begins. You leave the rat course behind. You return to the courtyard. 
so with the gambling muck in here with the dice, if he... How would this work? He gives me 10 gold. If I lose a match, he gets his money back. And I seemingly don't owe him anything. If I win the match, he needs to give me 10 more gold, at which point I repay him the original 10, then play a second match to try and get 10 more of him. That's... I can see how that could be used to grind out some money, but it's it's tough, especially learning each gambler's pattern. And if they get to choose first, then that can really throw things. If I get to choose first, I need to be careful. There's a way... Is it like two less than the maximum of what you currently have or something or something? There, there is a formula to, to force them to... Because, because it's alternating guessing you end up getting backed into a corner where you have to either make a, a claim that's going to make them call it and it will be false and you'll lose or you have to call it and you'll lose because of the exact... It's weird. Hmm. Let's make a move. I am going to head in this direction. You walk deeper into the cool of the monastery. It is much quieter in here. Your footsteps echo on the cold stone floor as you emerge into a wide hall. Pews line one side and an altar is in the corner. I'll listen to the singing. And rest a while. I will stay a while and listen. You pause for a while to listen to the singing. It is a strange tune, restless, sometimes harmonious, but at other times horrifically atonal. It is as though all the singers are singing their own songs, letting them coincide or conflict as luck would have it. The effect is rather unsettling and not especially pleasant. Such is the worship of Effie, apparently. You take a moment to rest on one of the stone benches. In a piece, it is a peaceful spot, perhaps the most peaceful in all Mampang. Chanting fills the space. You could explore the monastery further or return to the streets. There are beds here. There might not be enough for me as well, but then there may. You move closer to the altar in the pews. Some kind of service is going on. Monks are clustered in groups chanting in a slurring monotone. A monk in bright red robes, the abbot stands with arms outstretched. I will watch as long as I'm not expected to participate in a way that would reveal my ignorance. You stand and watch for service. The chanting is odd. A droning buzz lacking discernible phrases. You catch snatches of what might be the words. Might be words, but they sound like a strange imitation of language. I think this is supposed to be a description of Tibetan monks chanting. But it's a very negative description, if that is the case. Then again, this is a very evil, negative place. It could almost be a very ignorant description. Okay, Some of the monks are jovial, whispering to each other and jostling, but others are solemn. I'm not going to doze off just yet. I'll wait a little. The abbot, his bright habit distinguishing him, stands placidly at the front of the room. The altar near him is covered in bronze. Its top battered and pitched. Atop is a small bowl and a set of metal dice. The chanting peters out, and the abbot smiles. I will wait. Is something bad going to happen if, if I... if I fall asleep and miss something? Or if I stay... More importantly, is something bad going to happen if I stay awake? Am I being lulled into a trap here? Brothers and sisters, the abbot declares, we give thanks to Effa. We meditate on the changes and chances that fill our lives. We give ourselves over to the dice roll, to the risk, and let her nudge as she sees fit. He gestures to a monk who approaches the altar. Sister, it is your day to roll. If I sleep, I may not be required to roll. If I stay awake, I get to see what some of the expected results of rolling may be. The monk approaches, grasps the dice, and then tosses them across the altar with a clang. 
the abbot considers the dice and tuts. No luck for you. Half rations for a day. Think upon this chance. I could get food. There's a long stretch of chanting and then the service comes to an end. The monks file out towards the garden or linger by the altar. The echoes die away. The monks stand and file away. You step back to the doors once more. Behind you, the ceremony comes to an end and the monks file past into the courtyard. The abbot himself emerges from the room in quiet discussion with a few senior monks. Right. If I... Look, the abbot's going to know every monk here in the, in the abbey. He's going to know that I'm an imposter. Or a newcomer. He's also speaking to a bunch of senior monks. This is, a, this is a more important matter than me just interrupting him. I should be humble after all, as befits the disguise. Monks move this way and that about their business. If that's the dormitory, what is this? And what is our bel belfry, right? And out here at the back with these gardens? Hmm. You head down a short flight of steps into the dormitories nodded at by passing brethren. You find a row of plain cots and a table cluttered with different games of chance. No monks are present as they are all busy with their duties. Several spare monks' habits hang from pegs in the wall, probably less flea-infested than this one. You climb back up the stairs to the quiet chamber. I do. So be it. Several monks, including the abbot, linger by the altar. Um, no chance to head outside just yet. Speaking to the abbot still feels like a trap. The monastery is busy and yet peaceful enough. So if that's a dormitory, is that a refectory on the other side? That would make sense. And the time now is... I could... Hmm. Um... Let's see if I can get into that chamber. You return to the altar room, obviously wasting time. A cluster of dormitories is further down the hall. The abbot stands by the altar, contemplating the scattering of dust in the light, if there was a good time to speak to him, it would be now. You catch the abbot's sleeve. Your head is bowed under your cowl, but he still stops you. And what do you think you're doing? He demands. Father, look over there while I run in the opposite direction. It's not what you think. Contemplating. You reply. Is that so? He returns of interest. Contemplating what? The sound of my footsteps, the rhythm of my breathing, the cracks of the stone. Random chance. The rhythm of my breathing seems for, like the best choice, but the cracks in the stone are less regular. He shakes his head. You cannot fool me so easily, the abbot smiles. Should you not be polishing the steps, novitiate? He turns you gently around by the shoulders, explaining a few points about the laziness of the younger orders. The abbot deposits you in the courtyard. Effer be with you, he murmurs before moving away. Well then. Perhaps I should polish the steps. You'll make your way down the steps and out of the monastery yard. I do not get to polish the steps to try and ingratiate myself with the monks here. You step out of the calm oasis of the monastery and back into the dust and grey of Mampang. The road stretches a short way in both directions. This does appear to be a well. The thing is, I've now gone back in time 
to before meeting Rani the pirate. So in theory, she doesn't know that I know that she knows about the treasure and the treasure vault which she claims exists. Right, so if I run into her later, trying to break into a treasure vault, she won't know that I know that I've met. She won't recognize me, right? You follow the road, which gets better kept and busier with every step. You are approaching some kind of central square. An old beggar woman lounges against a well nearby, watching people come and go from the market. A wider road leads west into a run-down area of the city. Clouds rumble as they roll across the dimming sky. Yeah, let's let's go see the beggar. We've been to the market before and couldn't afford anything. Perhaps I could give her my last coin. You walk over to the well where an old woman, a little more than a bundle of rags, sits. She does not look at you as you approach, but I shall look at her. Her face is obscured by a shapeless hood. She rarely acknowledges anyone, not even holding out her hand for arms. I'll look down into the well. You peer down into the well. Jump in if you like, the old woman remarks. There's no bottom to it. No bottom? You ask. None at all, she replies. No water either, just a great big hole. This place was built by sorcerers, you know. I'll greet her properly. Well met, you declare. There's a beggar reaching out for money. Look at the, the lines in her palm. The, the rags heaped on rags to try and keep her warm, even with a patch sewn on. Her voice, when she speaks, is raspy. Barely above a whisper, and her eyes, when they meet yours, are smooth, a smooth, glossy black. There you are, brother. Found you now. Spare an old blind woman a coin. Enough to buy a crust of bread, perhaps. Those aren't black, those are very white. I will give her my last coin. If she asks for another, I will have none to give. You toss a gold coin into her lap and she rocks back and forth, grinning. Oh, love, you have made Javine a happy... Javine... Javine? There's two N's, so it shouldn't be Javine. It should be like Javine. No, it could be still Javine. You have made Javine a happier woman. Bless you for helping me live out my last days. She pauses to test the coin between her teeth, then nods. Now, love, anything else for an old blind woman? Tell me what happened to your eyes. I'll tell you my tale. I was called on by the Archmage himself to examine one of his creations. The Archmage makes creatures, you see, of all mixtures and kinds. This one was a mucousy, slimy sort of thing called a mucolytic, a miserable thing born totally without fear. They are almost deaf and speak only in a whisper. Rather like yourself, woman. Sounds a most formidable beast. Not formidable, but deadly all the same. I got too close, so close that it attacked, and that was that. I lost my eyes to it. How exactly? The breath, Javine says. I got up close to take a look, and its poison breath blinded me. A monk told me I was lucky, that was all I lost, but I don't know. I just can't see it that way. She chuckles at her joke. I don't know, I just can't see it that way. And now you are a beggar. I was a healer before, but now, yes, now I beg. I sit here every day with little to pass the time, but the tormenting I receive from the sight masters. So this is a clue. She can tell us the sight masters are not good here. The sight masters torment you? She spits. <laughs> Those bug-eyed monsters delight in my suffering. One lacking sight is a source of much curiosity to them. 
Half of them want to kill me and half of them are in love with me. And those halves aren't entirely separate halves. Goddess, forgive me, my foul mouth. The ones from my homeland were honourable. Then she'll know I'm from a long way away. You hate the Sightmasters. But then she'll say the ones here are different, right? The ones from my homeland were honourable. These may be outcasts, then. It is hard to say. Were you born here in Mampang? She shakes her head. No, there's those here who don't believe in the world beyond, but that's where I came from. I lived in a small village on the shores of Earth End. What, like the Earthsea Trilogy? A healer priest from Dadu Yadu was shipwrecked there and took me on as an apprentice. I loved him and then I abandoned him and I came to Manpang against his wishes, drawn by the promise of fortune in the Archmage's surface. Why did you abandon the priest she's just told me? You worked for the Archmage, I've established that already. Why did you abandon your priest? Oh, my love, she replies with a wishful sigh. Because he was betrothed, of course. She yawns with such vigour that she throws a cascade of spittle onto your shoulder. What a lovely chat, Javeen says. I so rarely get to talk these days, love. Come back any time, she grins, especially if you slay one of the Sightmasters. And she draws a line across her throat. I'll bid her farewell, and remember that killing the Sightmasters may be in my favour. Goodbye, you declare with a nod. You leave the woman huddled by the well. One new clue will probably be about the mucolytic, and not about the Sightmasters. You were given advice. Beware the breath of the mucolytics. And now that I have received that advice, is that really the only place I can go? Fine, I'll go there then. You return to the western side of the square. Javine appears to go back to sleep. A wider road leads west into the run-down area of the city. The sun has almost set and the sky has turned a deep purple. It'll be night soon. Hey, maybe the Archmage was looking for me because guards found me in here. But I think he may have been looking for me before that. Let's head back to the monastery where I can rest. You walk west out of the square following a wide road. It passes by the monastery gate. Darkness closes in. You should find a suitable spot to sleep, especially on an empty stomach. You're back outside the Monastery of Effa. It is closed for the night. Bugger! Veils me hoping I'd get to sleep in there as well. Must have spent too much there earlier. Maybe I can go back through the gate. The road curves along the edge of a tall stone wall, eventually reaching the door to the wheat fields. The moon moves slowly across the dark sky. The night air is cool and good for walking. This will be a good way of finding out if I can, if I am being sought by the Archma Archmage or if I have still avoided detection. You step back into the whispering wheat of the field. The heavy door slams shut behind you. Then I shall move towards the tower and into the grasslands once again. Like it said in the words... You walk on through the tall swaying stems and onwards still to the spire. Not going to sleep out here in the grass where I can get found by some stranger. You stride onwards through the long grass. You again stand below the spire. Remember, I was spotted sleeping in here, so that could be why the Archmage was looking for me. But there's nothing more here for you. You turn away from the spire. I literally want to sleep here. Game. Well then, here it is. This seems like a safe enough place to rest, lost among the stalks. But as you settle down, ants begin to swarm over your arms and legs, nibbling and biting. You jump to your feet once more. You would do better to find some kind of shelter, for night is drawing on. Well then.
You move onward through the tall, swaying stems. This is roughly where the sleeping figure lay before. You make out the outline. Of, you can make out the outline of the broken stems of grass, but the creature is gone. It is the middle of the night. I want to go to the trap door. Why can't I go to the trap door? There's a room down there with a bed in it. Adventurer, beware! Within the shadow of Mampang, all design decisions are permanent. Yeah, I was just moving. I was dragging and moving. You walk on through the long grass. The night air is freezing cold, your breath freezing on your lips. Let's just hope it's not too late to sleep when I get down into the ruins. You stride onwards through the field of wheat. The grass here is strewn with rubble and rocks, which make the going difficult. The blocks have fallen from the outer wall, and a sheer drop beckons to the west. Come on. Come on. Trapdoor. Trapdoor, please. I'd love to sleep here, but... Trapdoor. Human arm bone, it? so I can't... Okay, fine, I'll just sleep here. If I can. You curl up amongst the uncomfortable stones, but cannot get comfortable. Perhaps there is a better spot elsewhere in the field. Irritably, you get back to your feet. I'm just not going to be allowed to... Uh, step away. Hang on. You peer down over the edge of a cliff, but are quickly overcome by an overwhelming compulsion to jump and to fall. Nope, nope. Stepping away from that. You step away, but with every step back, you feel a giddiness, as though you were about to trip and stumble. Clamber down the mountainside, just move away. You take another step backwards. This time you are sure that something is wrong. It is as though your legs were attached to the drop by chains, and those chains were being slowly tightened, ratchet by ratchet, dragging you towards the edge. I better be able to cast a spell here. You come to your senses after about ten minutes of climbing to find yourself clinging to bare rock by your fingertips and the toes of your boots. The crumbled wall seems endlessly far above you, and thankfully you cannot move your head far enough to look down. Whatever force compelled you to come this way has lost its grip on you for the moment, but no doubt is waiting at the top once more. Yeah, look, this is a very unhealthy long way down to doom that I see below me. I could cast a spell. Both my arms are busy clinging to the cliff face. You close your eyes and raise a prayer to Korga, but nothing changes. The rock wall grows no handholds, and your fingers regain none of their failing strength. In that case, I will go for a spell. You're about to open your arms to gather the starlight and cast a spell, hoping to levitate to the surface, or at the very least protect your body with a force field, but of course you cannot let go of a rock to begin the casting. You know what, I think I will continue climbing down. Because I d Oh god, how do I get back in though? How do I get back in? There is only one way to go. You climb further down the cliff face with no idea where you are going. This again felt like one of those channeled decisions with lots of false choices. Going further back up would just lead to the same trouble. The Archmage is looking for you. Yes, so I think the creature finding me in the spire was bad. You continue to climb until you are almost at the river. You can hear it rushing and splashing over rocks and stones as it hurtles and spreads through the valleys below. What are you doing here? What misstep has led you to this point? What of your quest? Suddenly, without warning, you are wrenched from the rock face by something gripping your shoulders. A grab of a rock? No, no, I'll just find out what's got me. You twist your neck to look around but can see nothing. To all appearances, you are now hovering in midair. Could it be a gold crest eagle? A gold crest eagle? Surely so. And as the panic recedes, you hear the flapping of wings. The eagles then are here, presumably to aid you and, for the moment, in secret. This one must have come out of hiding to save you. Eagle, fly! I am rescued, allegedly, in theory, a little bit. Perhaps he'll even take me somewhere. You are high now. 
Mampang is far below. Why are you here? You call to the bird, but it makes no reply. The eagles cannot speak, only crow, and this one clearly prefers to stay silent. Well then, it's like walking in the air, but with no snowman. Man, I was hoping to end this episode soon as well. The eagle climbs a little, swooping around the walls of Mampang towards an area of many turrets. Oh shit. Oh well. After a few minutes of flying, the bird begins to swoop down and eventually it drops you in a quite abandoned corner of the citadel. It does not reveal itself, but flaps away into the air, all but silent. Still, at least you know they are waiting, if only to take you home once your mission is complete. I'll wave to the creature. There's no one around to see me. You wave to the creature, hoping it escapes to its hiding spot without being detected. Then you look around to see where you have ended up. And I'm back here again. Ooh. You are by the base of a stone tower with a curved archway at its base. You cannot help but shiver. You are back amongst the haunted power towers of the inner college. And with that hideous revelation, I'm going to end this episode here because it's gone on for quite long enough. I hope you've all enjoyed this one, in which not a lot of progress was made, really. And I will look forward to seeing you all in the very next one. I'm going to say goodbye for now, though, and cheerio, everyone. See you all next time.